everybody and then we'll, and then we'll wrap up and there's a bit of a homework task between now and, and the next one or two weeks time as well. So, who wants to kick us off?
to see what's in front of you, rather than just here, here, and here. So it's adding that extra element in, and it's thinking outside the box, well, what, how can I make this more game like? Because I actually think there's value in that, because it's the basic skills that we need to practice, mixing it in with the competition element, but mixing it in with pre-scanning in the moment to see what's happening down here. And then if you really wanted to make it com competitive, once the defenders actually got the ball, then they would have to connect with the player at this end. And if they connected and found the pass, then that could be a point for them. I think one point, I, I know we've talked about this draw a lot, but I just I wanted to, to mention it just because I thought it was a really good point that my group highlighted around that um, first drill, drill game, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> Everyone's got a different opinion, I'm sure. Um, but, and I don't know what skill level you guys are all working within your teams, but some of um, our coaches found that they had some really, really good players and then they had some that couldn't even trap the ball. And often that's really hard in a game scenario because people, you get the dominant people and the people who just don't want to play. So what they actually quite liked about that setting is that it allowed a first half where those players who aren't so confident could actually achieve something. And they had the trap and they had the pass and they just passed it to the cone and they could do that bit really well. But then those more advanced players had a component where they could have a little bit more flair and practice you know, taking someone on and, you know, you could add in the competition components. So having the two phases did kind of almost cater to the two different parts of the team. Mm -hmm. Just thought I would mention that, depending on what level you're working with, whether you might have a skill range. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any other comments on, from, from you guys around anything we saw across any of the three activities? This is definitely sort of kind of cover a little bit of a around if, it get, if it's not quite working, then it, the, the rules just get slightly changed, or the stakes get risen slightly higher, or yep. and that just ad adaptation as they move through. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, like, a, a way I think about it is this, is this too easy or too hard for them? Because it's like what we're saying as we're coming in, Roger, like sometimes you've got to make it a lot simpler, mm -hmm. other times you're like, oh, actually, they're getting this a lot faster than I thought mm -hmm. they would. Yeah. How can I make this a little bit harder? Um, but the beauty, like I always say to coaches there, you know, like your players will never know if you just go, like I was saying to Judith, you know, sometimes I put in a game and a player does something that I didn't even think of and I'm like, ah, oh, bugger. Yeah. <laughs> like, that's real my game, you know, like so you can just be like, but right, stop neural and you can you adapt on the fly, like they have no idea that, you know, that that's happened. Or e equally, like you can say, look, you guys are too good for me, like you've broken the game already, here's a new one, there's no harm in stopping a game whenever you need to to add in something else, you know, like it just adds a little bit to your kind of vulnerability as a coach if you can admit that you made a mistake or, you know, whatever it might be. I also really like how he would bring them in and ask them, what do you think? What's going on? Why would you do that? What's this? Instead of just bringing them in and saying, this isn't working, this is what you're not doing, this is, you know, you're doing this yeah. well, whatever. Again, he's making them give him the answer and think about, well, you know, I'm not running out here, so that player continues to get the ball or whatever it is, yeah. and the players then having to think about it by themselves. And I think that's quite important sometimes when we are coaching that we don't be so directional on yeah. what we're wanting them to do. Which is a very interesting point because there was two different coaching styles with the three or the, mm. the three v three game. So on this side they were asking those questions, and on this side they were very directive. Oh. And I was looking at bodies, like player language, yeah. uh, body language of the players, get my words out, um, and this group was just, yeah, 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 but this group was actually engaged in the conversation and actually thinking yeah. about it, and they looked more enthused to actually go out and try what they just had to talk about, whereas these guys were just going out for the sake mm -hmm. of going out for it, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's always reading your, uh, your player's body language is really important mm -hmm. as a coach. Questions get them engaged. Trying to keep flowing with your other. Yeah, yeah. So <coughs> there's a couple of questions. So in this room, if we think about the drills that we saw, especially that first, well, games, but <laughs> the first, because it's more like a drill, and um, the first exercise, should we say, call it? Um, does everyone have that space at training? No. 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 
So how could you, this is, and we'll take it away because we're going to time, so think about how you could actually adapt that to the space that you have at training. So it's always good to go out and go, oh yeah, that was really good and I've, I've got all the space and it looks really good out there, but if it's not going to go onto the size of turf that you have for your trainings, how can you adjust it? So rather than scrap it completely, how can you change it um, for your dynamic? The other question I would put to you all um, is how could you incorporate goalies into what we're doing? So if we think about down in that corner, was there a goalie in there? No, who, where was the goalie? And who was with the goalie? Coach. Yeah, another coach. So do you always have a lot of coaches mm -hmm. available? Yeah. No, so how could you actually incorporate a goalie? Because actually the whole team was there mm -hmm. and the goalie's there and we often create this divide. Mm -hmm. But on the fly, in an open discussion, how do you think we could create a goalie into that drill? Well, game. Yeah. Yes, of course. You've got to be in one of the squares and we have to invite it to that Yep, yep, so the goalie can be in a square. Mm -hmm. How else could we? the goalie moving, like he doesn't have to be in one square, mm -hmm. yeah. he could also have to run, mm -hmm. can goalies run in the game? But you know, like he has to then be watching and tracking where the ball's going to see which square he should be getting into to then save that yeah. ball. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so two good suggestions, how else could you incorporate them in? You uh, maybe incentivize the suggestion what you said to us, I'm listening to you. That's right. <laughs> so use the goalie yeah, for deflections and actually incentivize that, that activity to pass the pass off the goalie. Yeah. Oh. yeah, and what's that then creating for the goalie? Oh. Accuracy. Accuracy with putting the ball? Yeah, yeah. accuracy with where deflecting the ball. Yeah. Well. yeah, so rather than just trying to disrupt, yes, he or she has to actually think about where they're kicking the ball. And like we said, if we wanted to create um, give and go passes, so um, passing the ball and getting it back, you can actually create double points for that if you get it into the goalie. And then get it back from the goalie. Yeah, and get it back from the goalie. So that's always sort of think about how you can incorporate your goalie, because um, I think there's value in them being part of the games, not just in the goal. Yeah. And the other thing, just to add to it, the other question is always think about what's my purpose in this game? Am I going to be directive or what questions do I actually need to be asking? And what's my purpose behind putting the different rule in or putting a competitive element in in terms of our outcome? Yeah, I think that's a really good point, Kat. Um, I was saying, I can't remember who I said it to, but for me the beauty of games, particularly, I mean, all of them probably, but particularly the second one, I was like, you could use that game every training for three weeks and it could probably have a different purpose. So don't don't feel like you just you know use a game for one week and be like, oh I can't use that again. Like the, like that second one, just rattle off like what, what could you be trying to achieve? What skills could you be trying to develop in that game? Spatial awareness. Spatial awareness, yep, what else? Postation. Grace, yep, no, what else? Tackling. Tackling, awesome. Long, long pass and short pass. Cool, great. So there's, there's four right there, yeah? So, mm -hmm. yeah, you can always, like, Kat's mm -hmm. made a really good point. What's the purpose? Because the challenge for coaching, like I said um, at the start, is don't get lost in watching the athletes. That's the same challenge when you're training, when you're, when you're actually training your teams as well. As, and I find it still now, you know, I get so lost in, you know, following the ball sometimes, I forget about actually what is this game trying to achieve? What's the purpose that we set it up for? And how can I actually watch that to make sure it's being achieved? And I find that it's almost like the coach's curse as we get to kind of narrow vision and what's happening with the ball and sometimes we lose focus of mm -hmm. what we're actually trying to achieve. So if you do want to bring up your point around constraints. Yeah, do I need to come on to <laughs> Of course. <laughs> um, oh, it was more just a question, really. I think sometimes as we... Um, look at drills and, and games and we start to critique them and especially as coaches when we're not getting our desired outcome because half the time we're going in with a purpose and the purpose is to do this um, and when it's not happening before we start
start to think about the three components to a game, we start to think about adding a constraint in. So um, you're no longer allowed to have, um, I can't think of one off the top of my head right now. Three um, budget. Yeah. Mm. So you put in a constraint, and it's kind of almost like your natural tendency as a coach. But my challenge for you guys is instead of, well, sorry, actually, my question is, what is the what is the negative part to adding a constraint versus adding a, a rule? Can anyone tell me? In the decision making, they are not free to you know, decide. Yeah, yeah. So by adding a constraint, it takes away a decision making component. Versus if you add a decision making component, you're actually taking away whatever you, you're potentially taking away what you do don't want them doing, mm -hmm. but they're figuring it out for themselves. Mm -hmm. you know, so instead of saying, okay, you're not allowed to pass through the middle, can we add a decision-making element where it's two points for the outside, mm -hmm. one point for the inside, and they can still go through the middle, but it's up to them to decide which way to do it. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah. Then with that as well, it can be a progression. So depending on your team's level, mm -hmm. You actually probably need some constraints to then go, oh yeah, well when I do only have three touches, this is what happens. Whereas if they're at a higher level and actually have that game awareness, then you go into that decision making element and it's probably working out where your team sits mm -hmm. and it's, it's that balance between constraints versus decision making and you ultimately you want to get more towards the decision making side, but you may need to have constraints earlier on to then allow them to make the decisions. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So we've got about, let's say, three or four minutes. Um, is there any, any questions or anything that you want to discuss before we wrap up from anything you've seen or any questions you might have had before you even came tonight um, that, you, that you can fire out to us or to the group? If not, we'll. Uh, I guess for me as a new coach, um, I'm always wondering where do I get um, ideas for games? Well, I think the fact that, no, it, it was a point, I think Roger said something which made me think, like, I would, um, well, I mean, yeah, it was your point around, like, a lot of what you've seen is kind of based on more traditional drills, and I think that's a really good point, like, you, you potentially have enough in your head from experience to go like, if I tweak that, could that become more of a game for me? Um, and I think coaches are always like, I, I think we're thieves in a lot of instances. Like I see a lot of, you know, I see a lot of stuff that that other coaches do, and I'm like, oh no, so I like that. I'm going to take that and yeah. implement it. You know, I'll tweak it. <laughs> yeah, yeah all YouTube, that. yeah, all of that stuff. You know, like Instagram, just loads. Yeah, Instagram and YouTube are really great tools and resources as well. Do you, is there anything that Art of Hockey provide? Forgive my ignorance, I actually don't know. <laughs> yeah. It's a work in progress for us. Um, I'll speak on that But I, no, no, but it, it, it proves the point that we, um, yeah, we don't potentially have, you know, a massive drills library where we can be like, here, go try these and make them your own. But mm. what we can't reiterate enough is that um, we can provide, you know, games or options and stuff, but at the end of the day there's only so many that we can provide and the key is for as a coach understanding how you can develop yourself yes. and just taking a time the time to go and watch another training or you know you've met some people tonight, can I just come down and um, watch watch your training next week or connect and say, hey look, this is what I did last week. Does anyone want to try it next week? Um, just yeah, you can't I can't reiterate enough the learnings that you can get from other people. And I think that's what tonight was so valuable about is that even if, you know, with our group, all of our discussions weren't necessarily about the game that was in front of us, but we connected through coaches who have potentially never actually taught coaching before together. And hopefully some people have walked away with some drill ideas just because we had a discussion. Mm -hmm. So, and don't be afraid to ask your players as well, um, particularly if you're working with the younger ones, saying, hey, what do you actually, what games do you do in school? And they'll be like, all right, let's throw it into hockey. How do we make that hockey related? Um, ask other codes. Yeah, I don't know if that helps answer your question. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there is sport plan available yeah, as well, well, and that has a hockey section and it's got some games in it, but it's also got drills. And then you now, with your knowledge, you can actually adapt the drills into a game. Yeah. I mean, the biggest tip that I'd give is and it comes back to that yeah. spatial awareness mm -hmm. and decision making. So, where on hockey turf are you hoping to target? So based on what you're playing, so say out there, the defensive group were coming out to either side because as a group you want to come out 
to then go rather than mm. going straight down the middle. So it's where do we actually want the players to target? Where is the understanding in terms of space that we want them to develop? And almost create your game based on that. Mm -hmm. And so in that one down there, it was literally four zones mm -hmm. and you based your game off those four zones. And that was creating about the skills down here. It was zones on the sideline to then target that to then come back in. So when you're thinking about games, think where are the zones that we want to target and how can I adapt it based on that. Because another really simple game is to have your main goal and then to have either two boxes on either side as an outletting, it's similar to the sideline, and then one group targets the boxes and then one group targets the main goal. And you just mix up where you put your zones. And what if you don't? I'm gonna do mm -hmm. a basic yeah. question, but I struggle with the girls learning to go for the rebounds because we don't have a goalie. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So yeah. one thing with that is you get you can get like a pink wood, or you actually yeah, get a goal, yeah. and mm -hmm. you actually to score a goal, you have to hit it in, and then the next person has to hit it into the goal mm -hmm. to get it. Mm -hmm. So that's rebounding out and then the next player's coming in or they could as if the goal rebound as if the goalie stopped it. Mm, that's a good idea. Yeah. So again, so your thing was rebounds. Mm -hmm. So you think about well, what is the action of rebound and how can I create that same action through a game? Yeah, I'm going to 
the whole time. Yeah. yeah. If I could build on that point as well, um, I was saying to, to um, Roger and Patty and, and Isaac, the, the six minutes, like I asked them, like what's the, what's the maximum amount of, amount of time a player is going to be working for before they get a break? and set up the timing of those types of games to mirror that. So you're actually building their fitness levels for what they need to do before they get a break too. So six minutes could be really good because that's your sub-rotation system and you know that they're on for six minutes and then they're off. So use those games for that period of time so they're training the same energy systems that they would be in a game. So again, you know, it's linking back to this point here. How can I make it as similar as possible? Cool. Awesome. All right. Do you, do you need to wrap up today? No, I think everyone's good, but um, I guess I'll just briefly say thank you to obviously all of you guys for taking time out on your Sunday night, and thank you to our facilitators um, for coming along on your Sunday night as well. I hope everyone feels like they walked away with something. As we've already touched on, se uh, session two is in two weeks' time. Um, I'm not sure if everyone has signed up or not, it's obviously not compulsory, but it is definitely highly recommended because we're kind of hoping that this is a bit of a continuum. Um, and then for those that might, that it might not have been so clear, we have a third session, um, not necessarily connected to the first two, but it's actually more of a technical skills class. So for those of you who want to get a little bit more of the what of coaching, so how to um, coach those more advanced points, that is the last session, I think, um, 2nd of July is the day, that's a Friday night. So um, most of you, I think, have signed up all three, but if you haven't, those are the ones coming up, so make sure you sign up.